is Bethany Gomez, Managing Director for Brightfield Group, which provides consumer insights and market intelligence for the CBD and cannabis industries. So Bethany is going to give us a state of the industry for the CBD food and beverage market. And she's going to cover four key areas. First, she's going to talk about the market opportunity for CBD food and beverages. Then she's going to provide a brief regulatory overview. Then she's going to talk about some new product innovations in the space. And then she's going to wrap up with some key takeaways for buyers and suppliers. So before we get into the webcast, I just wanted to remind everybody that you could submit questions to Bethany using the question and answer tool below. And then we will get to those during the Q&A portion at the end of the webcast. So with that, it's my pleasure to welcome Bethany Gomez. Thank you, Joe. Um, thanks for having me to the ECRM team. It's always a pleasure to um, to work with you all here. And um, to Joe's, Joe's point, um, you know, today we're really going to be zooming in on what is the state of the industry today in CBD, um, as well as um, with a, a key focus in on the food and beverage um, industry overall. So I know you all um, that are attending today are um, gearing up for um, the ECRM event next week um, and are really focusing in um, on the retail meetings that you'll be having um, as a brand or for the retailers, the, um, the meetings that, um, that you may be having with, um, with companies and brands in the category. So wanted to give kind of this, this landscape view on where things are right now um, in the category. So um, for those of you who aren't familiar with us, um, you know, at Brightfield Group, um, to Joe's point, we are a market research and consumer insights firm focused on the legal CBD industry. Um, we cover the market from a wide variety of different angles, and you'll see that data show through in the the presentation today. Um, that includes market sizing and forecasting, um, both at a top line and a category level, um, a deep level of competitive insights and analysis on, um, on the competitive landscape um, in the CBD market today. Um, we also do extensive um, survey work and consumer insights work. So um, we survey more than 5,000 CBD consumers every quarter um, on a wide variety of um, their behaviors related to CBD, um, including usage, um, uh, adoption of products, um, attitudes, reason for use, um, occasions of consumption, um, and things of that nature, um, and have also since the beginning of the pandemic been fielding um, on questions related to their buying um, buying behaviors and responses to COVID, which has been a really um, powerful um, indicator of where the market is going um, and opportunities in the space. Um, at Brightfield, we also do um, a great deal of work integrating um, additional methodologies like social listening um, into our um, into our analysis, which gives us a deep level of insight into um, what's happening right now, as well as where the market is going. Um, you know, this is certainly an emerging category, and you're all focused on what next year in 2022 and beyond is going to look like. Um, so we wanted to be able to provide that level of, um, of depth and insights for you. Um, you know, again, my name is Bethany Gomez. I'm the managing director here at Brightfield Group. Um, I helped start this company back in um, 2015. And, and prior to helping start this company, um, my background was in mainstream CPG, um, worked with a company called Euromonitor, um, focusing on um, industries like packaged foods, drinks, um, alcohol, retail, and food service as well. Um, so without further ado, we'll, we'll dig right in here. And again, um, you know, first we would really like to, to look at a landscape of what is happening in the market right now. Um, it has been a very um, chaotic year um, for everyone involved and 2019 was certainly a very exciting year for the CBD industry. So there's been a lot of shifts um, in the market um, over the past 12 months. And so we want to level set those expectations on what those um, shifts have been to date and what those leading indicators are on the opportunity opportunities and the, um, the potential in the market um, with a particular focus on that um, food and drink space. Um, obviously, regulations are a big question mark in everybody's mind. So we want to look at um, what kind of the, the landscape is right now from a regulatory standpoint, but what that is going to mean for the market um, and for, um, for brands and retailers operating in the category. Um, and then a, a deep dive into this innovation focus. Um, there's been you know, in most industries, we've seen um, a slowdown in innovations during COVID. Um, that has certainly not been the case in, um, you know, in the CBD food and drink space. So there's no shortage of innovation going into the category. So we'll look at um, what some of those innovations are um, today and the different types of um, products that are rolling out and what implications that will have um, for you and for the consumers. 
Right. So, um, so what is happening in the category right now? Um, and you know, to um, you know, to no one's surprise, given the uh, the pandemic that we're operating in, um, 2020 has been a very turbulent year. Um, in 2019, um, CBD really kind of grew up. Um, it kind of exploded into all sides of the world, grew by more than 500 percent. And by the close of the year, it was moving into nearly 100,000 retailers around um, the country in a wide variety of different channels. Uh, more, you know, thousands of brands had entered um, the space and developed new products, um, and consumer adoption had hit more than 15%. Um, Q2020, and we are having a bit of a stabilization year, um, you know, in the industry. And there's a wide variety of different um, different um, things that are impacting the category. Um, even prior to COVID hitting, um, we were um, experiencing a um, some price compression um, in the industry, and this has been rolling through um, all across categories um, started at the um, the end of last year with um, you know some of the the strong drops in commodity prices um, as well as some of the demands of retailers as these products started to make their way into um, you know more mainstream shelves um, this impacts again all all different types of categories of CBD but we really saw 30 to 40 percent price um, price decreases um, as um, as products were looking to um, compete more directly um, against non CBD products products um, on their shelves. And um, that, you know, even before COVID, that was something that was um, that was particularly persistent. And then once COVID hit, we saw um, particularly in D to C brands, a culture of discounting emerged there as well. So, you know, that price um, compression in 2020 has really um, served as a correction um, in the market um, that depresses that kind of top line value growth, um, but is not necessarily something that is going to um, going to continue to depress growth as it's kind of and a level set and adjust in um, expectations there um, in the market overall. Um, certainly during 2020, we've seen a, a bit of a slowdown um, due to um, COVID-related store closures. And, you know, that has beat up, um, you know, some channels um, and, um, you know, certain brands and certain product types um, due to some of those artificial corrections in the market, um, you know, with, um, you know, particularly due to, you know, the closures in Q2 um, that we were seeing in the market. Um, now, as, as the world has started Started to reopen in Q3, uh, we've seen a lot of that market start to rebound and a lot of those trends start to um, start to recover, um, certainly not to the level that they were, um, you know, pre-COVID um, in many circumstances, but um, we are expecting with this, um, this trajectory that we're seeing right now, um, a, the final um, 2020 growth for the overall CBD category um, to come in at approximately 14% growth versus um, 2019. So kind of a stabilization year. Um, with that strong kind of recovery, um, you know, emerging um, as the world uh, returns to normal. Um, now there's a, a new normal and we'll get into a lot of the, um, you know, the impacts of the market um, and where um, where the opportunities and where the challenges are in, um, in this category moving forward. Um, but, you know, as well as some of those um, underlying consumer um, trends as well. Um, certainly one of the things that has impacted food and beverage um, in um, in 2020 has been um, these delay in um, FDA um, regulations as well. So, you know, many of us were expecting by the end of 2020 to have a bit more um, in terms of guidance from the FDA um, into um, what those regulatory structures would look like. Um, that has, as a result of the of COVID, that has gotten pushed out um, a bit and is now expected more in 2021. Um, so, you know, a bit of a, an adjustment year um, in 2020 um, for the CBD space overall, um, but there has been a lot of the, the shocks that have impacted the market have um, really had a, um, have been artificial in nature and a lot of the, um, the impacts and the underlying, um, underlying fundamentals of the market remain very strong. And as we look at uh, the impact of, um, of specific trends in the space and the forward-looking potential, we really look to the consumer. Um, as this is a consumer insights and consumer-driven market, um, there is, uh, you know, the potential is really driven by how well these products are, um, are landing with consumers and what their adoption rates are. There was a lot of conversations, you know, last year and, you know, earlier in the year on whether CBD would be a 
flash in the pan style trend or whether this was a, um, a real growth industry that had staying power. And you know, as we look at those you know, consumer insights trends, that really gives us um, an indication of, um, of where the market is and whether this is an industry that does have um, strong potential moving forward. Um, so looking at these consumer adoption rates, um, you know, when COVID first hit, you know, consumers have been, um, you know, very price sensitive across the, um, across the board and many consumers um, started cutting products that they did not consider to be essential to them. Um, as you know, one thing that is really sticks out um, related to, um, to CBD um, is that the amount of consumers or the amount of CBD that consumers are using has dramatically increased um, over the course of the last year. So a lot of consumers that were first trying products and last in 2019 were experimenting with products had first entered the category were using um, once a week, once a month, kind of a novelty style product. Um, those consumers are now shifting into daily um, or multiple times a day habitual users. Uh, we saw that number um, increase. The percentage of consumers that were using at least five times per week increased to 55% in 2020. Um, so this is a really strong indicator that these products are really becoming um, part of people's habits, uh, people's everyday routines, um, and they're not necessarily willing to compromise on those. Um, there are still consumers, new consumers entering the market um, as well. Now, not to the extent that we saw last year when CBD kind of came out of nowhere and went from, you know, 8% of, um, of overall adults to 15% of overall adults using products. Um, but we have um, seen um, continuously over the past, um, in by Q2 2020, 25% of CBD consumers had begun using products um, within the past six months. So that this indicates indicates that um, there are still additional um, newcomers coming into the category, driving trial, and overall their satisfaction levels with the products are um, overwhelmingly high. Their desire to, um, to repeat purchase um, and to increase their consumption and become those daily users um, continues to grow over time. Um, so this you know, uh, results in kind of a, a shift in the way that um, companies are approaching um, the market, but also indicates a very strong um, opportunity for the category overall as these do become um, everyday habits that people are really relying on and depending on um, and things that they're not willing to compromise on it really shows that the, um, that the underlying fundamentals of this market um, are strong. And, you know, to, we wanted to see, you know, not only um, how consumers are thinking about um, CBD and how they're using CBD, but why? Why would a consumer spend on um, something that is, um, you know, at a high cost in nature um, during a pandemic or doing, during a, uh, an economic recession? And um, this really drills down to the reasons why people are using CBD. Um, the dominant reasons why people use CBD um, are for stress relief, for anxiety, for insomnia, for depression. Um, you know, the key desired effects that people are looking for um, out of CBD are um, to help with sleep, to help with, um, to help with stress, to help, um, you know, we also have a, a physical relief component that that is one of the top five um, reasons. But beyond that is a lot of um, emotional and mental health relief, um, which is really, um, really prevalent um, during this pandemic, um, as so much of the world is focused on self-care, right? Um, you know, we are certainly facing a, um, a, uh, a, a crisis, a mental health crisis of kind of uh, epidemic proportions here. And uh, most Americans and, you know, and many people around the world are really just looking for something to help them take a bite out of the day, help be very proactive about their self-care and kind of take care of themselves. Um, and CBD has um, provided for many consumers has provided an outlet for that. 75% um, of CBD consumers agree that CBD CBD helps me deal with the stress of the pandemic. Um, and, uh, you know, many consumers are really increasing the amount of CBD that they're using during the pandemic, um, with a particular focus on those Gen Z and millennial consumers um, who have been most heavily impacted from um, a mental health standpoint and are most proactive about self-care um, in their own mental health. 46% um, of um, Gen Z consumers and 51% of millennial consumers uh, report um, using CBD more frequently since the, um, the pandemic hit. 
market. Um, and this has continued to increase. We've been pulling on this every quarter, uh, you know, with the Q1, essentially right as the pandemic hit, um, we had um, data going into the field on that, um, filled it again in Q2, and then um, just pulled Q3 results um, and have been processing those. And those numbers have continued to increase um, throughout the pandemic. Um, more and more people are, um, are using more frequently and really leaning on CBD, uh, which again is a, a strong, um, strong opportunity for the category and really um, speaks to the fundamentals there. Um, what I found really interesting, especially for um, you know this crowd as we're talking about brick and mortar and as we're talking about um, you know that uh, that dichotomy between brick and mortar online. Um, certainly, when the pandemic hit, many brands um, you know and consumers switched to purchasing online. Um, this is something that, um, especially when you go into lockdown and a lot of consumers were um, afraid to um, go out to the stores, started shifting to you know this online um, online purchase, and we did see that um, online um, consumption, particularly in Q2, go through the roof. Um, 41% of consumers in Q3, so you know, as the world started reopening, um, said they started um, recently have started purchasing CBD in physical stores again, um, and many of them do prefer this option. Um, so while some consumers are finding a habitual route through um, through online purchase, 41% um, um, still really prefer to go back to the stores, um, you know, even um, during the midst of a pandemic to purchase products. And we'll get into a little bit more about why that is and kind of the impacts of the space moving forward. But, um, you know, really the, the impact that brick and mortar, there's no substitute for brick and mortar when it comes to driving trial amongst consumers. Um, that ability to drive trial, get new products, get new ideas in front of consumers um, and allow them to, to um, sample products or be able to um, be exposed to pro products um, so proactively um, and with such an easy turnaround and opportunity to purchase um, really helps to drive trial and we expect as the, the world returns um, to brick and mortar that that will um, continue to drive um, those adoption rates of new consumers coming into the category as well. Um, so there's, you know, there's a lot of different dynamics in play here, but, you know, it, it all kind of starts and ends with, um, you know, with consumers and what um, they're really looking for out of products as their um, needs will really drive, um, drive the opportunities in the market, um, both, um, both during the pandemic and beyond. Um, um, let's look, take a quick peek in here on kind of the, the market sizing and overall potential for um, for the food and drink space in particular. Um, so when we look at um, CBD food, um, when we see look at CBD drinks and um, and foods overall, there's a lot of dynamics that have been impacting the market. Again, you know they have been really um, disproportionately. Um, impacted by this kind of um, artificial um, artificial constraints in the market. Um, because food and drinks are considered to be the highest level of um, risk from an FDA standpoint, this means that their distribution has been um, much more limited to, um, to independent retailers um, throughout um, over the past um, several years. Um, now, this has kind of driven this strong dichotomy between these independent retailers that have such a higher sell through and sales, you know, sales per outlet um, in those independent retailers versus the chains that may be only carrying um, topical products that don't necessarily move quite as quickly. Um, this is certainly exacerbated for, um, for drinks and, um, and edible products um, because um, you know, these are often products that, are, that move very, very well through gas stations and C stores. They have a relatively low price point um, ability to drive trial and pick them up very, very quickly. So these small packs, these individual products have moved so well through these, um, you know, small and independent um, retailers, um, particularly those gas stations, C stores, bodegas, um, when they do see those foot traffic, um, that's really um, helped to drive the growth of the industry. Now, because all of the, um, the market is still very underdeveloped um, right now, the, um, the landscape is largely populated by um, smaller, um, smaller to, um, to mid-sized brands that are developing new products into the category and really still looking to um, to scale up. So there's there's not um, a great deal of consolidation um, in the market right now. There are a few market leaders, but even those have um, relatively small percentages of the market overall. So there's still um, a great deal of opportunity for brands to come into the category and scale, um, as well as um, for you know, brands to be able to find those great retail partners that will help them to scale and um, be able to um, help, um, help grow those into kind of that strong national brand there as well. 
Um, now, with those constraints, you know, again, the, those artificial constraints in the category have really um, limited the market potential. And one thing that is, or the market opportunity um, to date, and I say that's an artificial um, constraint because we've really been weighing the size of the market in each of those, um, in both of the, the food and drinks categories versus the consumer, um, consumer reactions and the consumer adoption rates of those products. Um, and, you know, as well as the consumer sentiment surrounding um, uh, social posts um, related to food and drinks. And, you know, for example, um, food drinks only makes up 4% of the CBD market overall to date. So it's a relatively small percentage of that market, market overall. Um, but 14% of consumers um, say that they have tried at least one CBD drink in the past six months. Um, and most of them are overwhelmingly um, um, overwhelmingly satisfied with the products that they're purchasing. Um, so there's a great deal of opportunity. Consumers want these products. Um, they're di more difficult to come by. They're not not, um, you know, not readily available to them currently through um, C stores, through uh, you know most of the channels that they'd be looking to purchase them through. Um, but they do want these products, and you know that's something that has been um, that has also echoed through to um, to social listening. And you know when we look at social listening, we really look at the overall volume of posts or share of voice for these categories compared with um, you know the market opportunity. Because if there's a really strong um, strong consumer sentiment and strong share a voice for these product types and categories um, that is much um, that is very disproportionate to the amount of sales um, currently um, moving through those um, those categories. It does give this indication that there's um, there's an opportunity there um, for uh, for products if they can scale. Um, that consumers really want these products, and we found that again with uh, with drinks that brands um, that there is a um, a complete disproportionate um, share of voice for drinks. Um, you know, approximately twenty four percent. Of, um, of all um, social posts um, related to CBD came from drinks um, in um, earlier this year, um, compared with, again, that 4% overall market share. So that does give that strong indication that there's a lot of opportunity and potential there that is not yet being tapped due to that artificial constraints of the market. Um, so as we, you know, as the market does open up and as we do see some more um, FDA guidance, we expect that um, we are quite bullish on, on drinks um, in particular and in edibles overall, um, expect that market to grow um, by more than 20 fold um, between um, 2020 and um, 2025. So as we look at, um, so who are those consumers, those CBD food and beverage consumers? Um, and we find that they um, they use much more often and they're more likely to shop at brick and mortar retailers. Um, so again, this is unsurprising. This is where um, people find um, CBD products, but they're more likely to grab them as part of an impulse. Um, so 53% of um, CBD food and beverage users um, are using um, daily or multiple times a day. Um, and 80% um, you know, shop um, for CBD through um, C stores, gas stations, um, mass market, um, or um, CBD grocers or um, supermarkets. So this is particularly favorable, even given that there is not much, um, you know, that the distribution through these channels um, is relatively limited. Um, as consumers are looking to, um, are will pick these products up um, once they're available on shelf there. So really strong indications that there's an opportunity there. So what is happening from a regulatory standpoint? Um, essentially a whole lot of nothing right now. Um, it is a bit of a waiting game right now. Um, you know, the FDA has, um, you know, has certainly not yet given guidance on um, CBD, which many were expecting again by the, um, by, you know, around this time um, that we would start to see some more indications. Um, certainly there was a great deal of, um, there is um, some slowdowns that were related to COVID. Certainly the FDA has a lot of other things, um, you know, on their plate right now. Um, um, apart from um, apart from CBD, but we did see, and particularly at the first half of this year, there was a great deal of um, of slowdown in that um, in that approval process. Now, um, you know, there was a great deal of additional momentum started to pick up. The um, the FDA had a flurry of activity um, in um, around July of 2020, and um, have indicated there are um, picking up steam in terms of um, doing kind of the the types of testing and um, and regulation development um, that will allow us to begin to see. 
um, some more guidance. So we are expecting um, additional guidance to, um, to come through from the FDA um, approximately the middle of next year, right? Um, again, there's, you know, there's a lot of, um, there's a lot of moving pieces um, with the FDA, um, particularly related to COVID, um, but they are getting a great deal of pressure um, to, um, to accelerate that, um, the speed of the regulations coming out there. And as those, um, as the market develops, um, and as they do come out with guidance, we are expecting that that guidance to involve, um, to involve um, allowing for a framework for um, food and drinks, um, CBDs with food and drinks as a food additive um, with um, caps on dosage levels. So um, the biggest concern of the FDA um, right now um, is essentially twofold. One, don't make health claims, you know, making people making health claims that CBD is um, really, um, you know, that CBD is, you know, curing cancer or um, could cause people to go off of their other medications um, for in favor of using CBD based off of unsubstantiated health claims. Um, their other real concern is related to people using too much CBD and reaching that toxicity level um, that could cause um, issues with, um, with the liver. So most CBD drinks and food products um, generally have relatively low dosage levels. Um, and we do expect there to be caps involved in those overall um, dosage levels allowed for in drinks and um, food products um, from the FDA. Um, now, Without that regulatory framework, um, until that um, those regulatory framework is released by the FDA, um, essentially we are in a status quo environment, um, which means that you know some chains are starting to um, to carry ingestible products slowly, um, but there is a lot of caution involved. Um, there has not been a great deal of um, pushback against um, any um, any retailers that have been carrying those products um, across the board, but there is of course a great deal of caution involved um, in um, most chain retailers to. Date. That being said, um, the um, there is most retailers are expecting as soon as the FDA does give that guidance to be able to start carrying those products and to look to do so pretty quickly. Um, and for good reason, you know, we find that those retailers that are carrying ingestible products again can sell anywhere from you know, two times to 20 times as many, um, you know, as much in revenue of CBD products um, than those that are carrying topicals only. Now, in the meantime, um, we are not going to see a great deal of those large consumer packaged goods companies release food and beverage um, products. Um, they are essentially also waiting until the FDA gives guidance. Um, so essentially what we're looking at right now is a window of time. Um, there's a window of time where um, brands themselves um, can, um, you know, the brands can continue to develop their products and develop their formulations and develop their, um, you know, their consumer and brand awareness levels. Retailers can really focus on getting their their, um, you know, getting their um, vetting out their potential partners um, as once the FDA does give guidance, um, there will not be a great deal of, you know, CPG products that are available on market. The fastest route to market um, will be with the existing brands, um, many of whom are, um, will be attending the event next week. Um, so, you know, there is kind of a, a limited, um, we have a, a window of time while we're still kind of in this waiting game um, from the FDA level, after which, um, you know, there will be a great deal of acceleration in that market. Zooming in on what is happening from an innovation standpoint, and um, you know, CBD drinks and food have really seen the greatest level of um, of product development and innovations in um, you know across the category and across the industry. Uh, you know, about 18 months ago, there were very few food and drinks products on the market. Most of them were absolutely terrible, <laughs> and most of them were uh, were very, very early kind of Gen One um, products. But you know, the the flood of products and the level of innovation that we've seen go into this category over the past um, you know 12 to 18 months has really been monumental. And um, you know, we'll zoom in a little bit on um, on drinks and on foods um, in kind of a, a category by category nature to see what some of those key trends are. Um, um, and how those are developing. Um, and, you know, with CBD drinks, for example, um, this really speaks to where the greatest opportunities are um, in the category because it fits into um, really so many different day parts and so many different areas of, um, of the industry of the category. Um, you know, for those of you who are familiar with, um, you know, the drink space, um, there are a lot of different categories and subcategories and different kind of niches within um, drinks, everything from, you know, hot drinks to 
to um, waters and sparkling waters to kind of athletic, um, you know, and sports drinks um, to, you know, really across the board. And CBD is fitting into um, really um, most of those kind of functional beverage need states and um, day parts, whether it's, um, you know, morning, afternoon, um, you know, post-workout or exercise or in kind of those evening occasions of consumption there. Um, so if we look at here, um, we've seen um, some growth in CBD coffee in particular, um, where, you know, as well as teas and other hot beverages, but, um, you know, in the coffee space, this is an example of Green Roads, who's one of the top um, brands in the category, who has a, um, you know, a hemp flower coffee um, that has been um, really powerful and has, um, you know, had a really strong adoption rate amongst um, their kind of core CBD consumers, which offers an additional kind of point of consumption for um, consumers that may use other products throughout their day, but really like to start their day with um, a CBD coffee. Um, Recess is certainly one of the, um, you know, the leading brands in the drinks category, and they've done a really phenomenal job of um, developing brand awareness and reputation and really branding this positioning um, of relaxation and kind of taking a break or taking a recess, um, you know, with CBD. And, you know, this is really um, being used um, quite effectively by, can, um, by their consumers for for, um, you know, for kind of a, a substitute for that afternoon cup of coffee for creatives who are looking to focus or kind of drive their, um, their creativity, but it's a, a nice kind of relaxation point and is oftentimes considered um, more of a substitute for, you know, a spin drift or a LaCroix than, um, you know, than from, you know, a supplement or, you know, or things like that or other CBD products. Um, one thing that we found, you know, particularly from social media um, is that there's a really disproportionate amount of consumers that are looking to use CBD um, drinks for athletic purposes, um, you know, for um, particularly, um, you know, for athletic recovery or to help support with, um, you know, with um, athletic training um, and hydration. And, you know, as an anti-inflammatory, it does um, have some, you know, support properties in those areas. And so it, it makes sense with that type of a positioning. So we have an example here of, um, of Tempo, which has CBD shots. Um, those shots in general are, have been a really powerful, um, you know, adoption rate and adoption um, um, have strong adoption, especially through kind of the, um, the C-store and kind of grocery channel route, um, but is powerful both for athletic performance um, as well as kind of a, a pick-me-up or a, a substitute for many of the um, energy type shots as well. Um, we also have in here um, evening, right, for that evening kind of day positioning. And, um, you know, in here we're seeing a lot of kind of sleepy teas or um, water soluble sleepy drinks that are kind of used as, you know, a substitute for a sleep aid um, or potentially a substitute for, um, for things like a glass of wine at the, the end of the night um, or a cup of tea at the end of the night um, to help um, people kind of relax and unwind um, with kind of that extra melatonin. It helps with, um, certainly does help with sleep, which is one of the leading reasons why um, people are using CBD. So that's been another um, kind of powerful positioning and um, many products and brands um, have been rolling out lines that have been um, positioned towards that kind of sleep um, day part and positioning. So you can see with drinks, it's really um, it's really spanning um, a variety of different kind of conditions and day parts in there. So zooming in on, um, oops. Coming in on foods here, um, I'm excluding gummies from these categories as gummies has been absolutely exploding from a consumer adoption rate and is really positioned as much more of a supplement um, in the, um, you know, in the eyes of many kind of consumers um, with um, so we're going to kind of X that out um, from the rest of the edibles category um, because the positioning is a, is a little bit different. But we've seen growth both in kind of the sweet space, um, particularly those products that are kind of seen as an indulgence. Indulgences, um, affordable indulgences are things that have actually been really popular with consumers during the pandemic as they've been looking for kind of ways to help treat themselves and give themselves a little bit of a, um, a relaxation point and a little bit of spoil themselves a little bit when um, we're all kind of so deprived from so many other things in the world overall. And so, you know, these kind of bakery um, or these um, type of CBD brownies 
or chocolates have been really popular. Um, we see here from um, from a lot of you know small companies um, like um, with these kind of uh, strong innovative types of positionings um, and easy to dose and indulgent types of products have been um, gaining a fair amount of traction. Um, we see here a, a, a chocolate brownie, um, you know, full spectrum uh, cotton candy. Um, again, this is kind of reminiscent of um, a lot of nostalgia, which uh, we see in um, kind of the specialty confectionery space overall right now. Um, you know, this um, CBD marshmallows. Um, and even here, this is more on the um, <laughs> doing a throwback and nostalgia kind of thing. Um, but, you know, hemp extract, um, macaroni and cheese. Um, so there's, you can, you certainly can put CBD in everything, um, you know, and they have a, um, and, but it's really, these products in particular are really kind of playing into that kind of fun and indulgence type of positioning that um, when positioned right is, um, can be really effective for consumers. Um, also then zooming in, um, you know, it's not just on kind of the sweets side of things. Um, we are also seeing a more of a health focused um, variety of products as well. So, um, you know, some consumers that are looking for, um, looking to kind of enjoy their consumption um, or kind of give a, um, an overall well-being boost um, to their, um, their healthy snacking options is another kind of category that's emerging. And uh, this has been an emerging segment of um, consumers um, in CBD as well, those consumers that are just looking to be proactive about their self-care or view CBD. I don't have a condition necessarily, but I'm using CBD to improve my overall well-being um, are kind of the prime targets for a lot of these types of products um, like, um, you know, CBD, um, you know, protein snack bars or um, snack, these are hemp cookies, but they're kind of these high protein um, along the lines of these, you know, high protein type snack bars or, um, um, or um, on the go um, grab snack and CBD wellness based products. Um, similarly, you see um, from a, a small brand called Nature's Nosh, um, here is um, another type of kind of plant-based, um, you know, um, all natural um, snacks on the go that have um, CBD as an enhanced functional ingredient, again, designed to kind of enhance, you know, your overall well-being, your overall um, body performance um, that many consumers are looking for. Um, there's others that are looking for, you know, again, that athletic type of positioning. So the protein power is a good, um, good example of that. And we do see that kind of that making its way through this athletic type of, you know, positioning as kind of a, a standard um, in that industry, um, as well as, uh, you know, in more of the um, things that you can cook anything yourself, right? <laughs> so, uh, you know, olive oil certainly offer an opportunity um, or cooking oils or, you know, um, CBD as an ingredient allows people people to, um, you know, to include it into their own kind of cooking routines or things like that, um, which certainly gives that opportunity. At some point from a food, food standpoint, you wonder at one point, do people just want to, you know, consume CBD and then eat regular food? Um, but, you know, as you, if you want to kind of have design your own experience, then, um, you know, the ability of to add water soluble or to add, um, you know, cooking oil or things like that, it gives you that ability to customize that experience, um, especially as so many consumers are um, right now now looking to um, enhance their, um, you know, do more at home cooking or get more creative with their cooking as they may not be able to go out as much as they, um, they previously were. So that's a little bit about kind of the overall, um, you know, innovation landscape and want to leave some time for Q&A here, but, you know, hit on some of these key takeaways. Um, you know, certainly they are, as we mentioned before, right now you have kind of a window of time. You know, there's a window of time between now and about the middle of next year. Again, could be a little bit of a variable um, time schedule here, but uh, between now and next year when the FDA will give some more guidance. Um, and, you know, what, what do brands and retailers really need to be doing right now to set themselves up for success um, then, because as soon as that happens, the game will completely change, um, you know, for, um, for both brands and for retailers. Um, so for brands in the space, you know, now is really the time to perfect your product formulations. Make sure you're getting, um, you know, getting really strong products. You can still do some level of experimenting, um, but it's time to get your products um, into a really strong format where they can compete alongside, um, you know, other specialty um, food products and other kind of gourmet and premium food products. CPG products on the shelves. Um, CBD products command a premium, right? Um, they can't command a premium because of the ingredients that they have in place. 
um, but they need to be able to um, they need to be able to support that premium. People don't want to spend seven dollars for a granola bar that tastes like weed. So make sure that the products are strong, that they are you know going to leave their your consumers delighted. And now's the time to work out any of those um, kinks on the line. There's a great deal of variety between um, you know some of the the best products on the market, which are delicious and uh, you know have kind of the best formulations and those that are kind of the lower um, quality and um, still still gen one um, you know and really building that strong brand reputation um, you know awareness and loyalty levels because that's what your first um, mover advantage can really do here um, is get out in front of consumers and get them to know who you are and drive that loyalty um, because that loyalty is what is going to be the moat to help support your brand as larger consumer packaged goods companies um, come into the space. And that brand loyalty and brand awareness is what your retail partners will really be looking for to help drive consumers into, um, you know, into their stores and help to um, build up the reputation of those retailers um, as, you know, retailers that are kind of on the cutting edge and having these strong, successful products and brands um, in their, um, you know, on their shelves. With retailers, uh, you know, really vet your partners now, right? Um, know who you want to carry because certainly what we saw when, um, you know, when the farm bill first passed and um, retailers started picking up topicals is that this can happen very quickly. And, you know, the sooner that you can get to market um, once the FDA does give guidance um, or whether you're looking to, to carry those products now, um, if you have those relationships and your partners really developed now, um, you know, then that will really accelerate your speed to market there and help you, um, you know, build those relationships and be able to start capitalizing on that opportunity sooner. Um, and again, the, you know, the brands that are, while eventually there will be large consumer packaged goods um, companies in the category, they're not going to be there on day one. They're not going to be there. Most of them are not going to be there middle of next year. Um, so, you know, really, um, and a lot of um, consumers wouldn't want them even if they were. Um, so, you know, a lot of consumers really love the, um, you know, the niche brands, the ones that have um, have developed a strong, um, strong reputation in the category and have really focused on developing those really strong product formulations um, and use that time really wisely. So, uh, you know, now is the time to really start vetting those um, those brands and know who you want to carry um, and know who you want to start working with. Um, and you know, essentially use this use this time wisely, right? Um, use this time wisely. This is kind of an opportunity um, to um, so use it use it strategically for kind of the benefits that um, you know that you want to reap and where you want your company to be 12 months from now. Um, and with that, um, I am going to um, stop sharing and, and turn it over to Q&A, which I believe we have been fielding in the Q&A bar, right, Joe? Yes, we have. We have a few <laughs> questions in the queue. And uh, for those of you out there, uh, you still have some time to submit questions if you like. Any that we don't get to during this webcast, uh, we will forward to Bethany so that she can uh, answer you directly. So, uh, and by the way, I think there's probably some consumers out there that do want their granola bars to taste like weed. <laughs> some of them do. Yes, yeah, some of them probably do. Probably <laughs> a couple of people out there that do. So, but... <laughs> um, <laughs> so with that, so our first question is, uh, now you mentioned earlier, all right, mm -hmm. uh, that with COVID, a lot of people, you know, started going towards CBD products for calming, you know, for the mm -hmm. purpose of, of calming. So what were the key reasons before COVID? Mm -hmm. And then what do you think it'll go back to after mm -hmm. COVID or will it kind of stay the same? How will it have impacted it for good? Yeah, so it's a great question. Um, you know, as um, consumers have always been, you know, the top five reasons why consumers have been using CBD have remained pretty consistent, um, you know, over the past two years has really been, um, you know, anxiety, depression, insomnia, pain relief, um, and, um, and kind of overall, um, overall uh, relief, emotional relief, um, things like that. So, you know, while as anxiety levels have spiked, and kind of whether that's, extreme anxiety and kind of diagnosed anxiety or just overall stress levels, that's helped to really kind of propel CBD in those areas. Um, with uh, relaxation, more from a um, less from a, a strictly um, kind of diagnosed anxiety, um, you know, condition to a general 
I have a lot of stress and I want to relax. Um, you know, um, standpoint has really um, grow, grown a lot and kind of contribute to that significant additional growth um, since COVID. So we're really seeing kind of an enhancement of what we mm -hmm. were seeing before as people have become more stressed out um, in those areas. Physical relief has kind of um, fallen a little bit um, in relation to more of the mental health conditions um, that have kind of risen up in the, um, you know, in the um, areas of priority. Um, but it's, it's not a monumental shift versus what we um, saw um, previously. Okay, I noticed that in a lot mm -hmm. of the, the beverages that you mm -hmm. shared, I mean, they were all very functional. Yes. Uh, you know, mm -hmm. sleep, recovery, relaxation. Mm -hmm. So, mm -hmm. I, and I think that that's kind of tailor-made for the beverage market. Absolutely. And that's a trend that we're seeing in the beverage market overall right now mm -hmm. is a, you know, strong growth in functional beverage um, and consumers yep. really adopting to that. And that includes both in the CBD category as well as outside of the um, CBD category. We even saw, you know, um, you know, companies like uh, Pepsi, you know, release functional beverages with, you know, drift well and, um, you know, things like that looking to get into the um, you know, products for sleep, um, mm -hmm. you know, um, functional beverages for sleep standpoint. So really aligns with the way that consumers are thinking um, and moving away from kind of overall beverages um, that are uh, moving away from carbonates, moving away from, um, you know, more of, um, you know, uh, uh, products that are uh, more of the sodas or things like that and more shifting towards that functional beverage space in general. Gotcha. Plus, if you have melatonin in there along with mm -hmm. CBD, you can say this is for sleep. Exactly. So yeah. Slip it in there. Exactly. And those those functional ingredients um, in CBD have been um, really powerful in you know exactly that point, Joe, of making that um, being able um, for brands to be able to communicate effectively to consumers what these products do, right? <laughs> Which has been one of the biggest challenges for yeah. CBD overall. Great. So next question, uh, once the FDA provides guidance and the big CPG companies do start to get involved, mm -hmm. how's that going to, how do you think that's going to change the landscape? Yeah, absolutely. So it will definitely have a, um, a very significant impact on the landscape. So, you know, there are, you know, thousands of brands in the CBD industry overall right now, um, several hundred in the food and beverage space alone. Um, now in, um, in naturals, um, in natural categories outside of CBD, um, there are a great deal of small, um, small and kind of nation specialty brands that are able to be successful, um, but not necessarily scale. A lot of naturals consumers really enjoy small brands um, in general and they like local brands they like to feel connected to the brand identity and those brand stories so it won't necessarily kill off all of the small brands but it will make their existence a lot more challenging right mm -hmm. um, and um, you know especially as you look at kind of the mass grocers or um, you know the mass market um, retailers now CBD brand or CPG brands when those large um, CPG brands you know enter the category they may do so via line extension of their existing portfolios if they have products that that um, would align well with a functional beverage line extension overall, or they may um, enter the, the landscape with acquisitions, um, which is certainly something that, um, that we see um, quite frequently in the CPG space. So, um, but a lot of the smaller brands, um, not all of the smaller brands that are on the market today will survive um, by any stretch of the imagination. And we will see a strong disruption into um, in the category when um, those larger consumer packaged goods um, companies can get in and um, can kind of extend their reach. Great. Thanks. Um, next one. Currently, most mass retailers are only buying topical CBD products. Mm -hmm. When do you think mass retailers will start to open up distribution to ingestible CBD products mm -hmm. like tinctures, gummies, etc.? Yeah, so this is the this is the big question, right? This is the big question that everybody um, is asking right now, and you know it depends on the risk tolerance level of each retailer, right? So um, the biggest chains typically have the um, the lowest risk tolerance level, and the smaller the chain, the higher their risk tolerance level. Um, so we see a lot of the um, you know the natural grocers or some um, some smaller chains that are carrying products, um, ingestible products right now, um, and those are um, again. The those, those retailers that do typically see overwhelmingly higher, um, you know, sell through than those that do not, right? Um, so, you know, even, you know, up to 20 times as much. Um, so there's, you know, a strong benefit for those that do. Now, there hasn't been strong pushback 
from, you know, any regulatory body on those that have started to carry those products. So even though we have not yet seen FDA guidance, we see more and more retailers, you know, start to put a toe in these waters and, um, you know, and start to wade in that general direction. Um, so we have, we are getting indications that um, some retailers will start um, carrying these types of products really as early as Q1. Um, some more of the, you know, as this the, the retailers carrying these products kind of step up the value, um, the value chain there. Um, the largest and the most risk averse will really not start carrying these products until the FDA does give guidance, which we expect to be the middle of next year. So a bit of a ramp up between now and then, but um, kind of the, the floodgates open once the FDA says go. Great, thanks. Mm -hmm. um, okay, next one. In CBD drink or shot categories, what is the position or assessment of nutrition label versus supplement label acceptance? Yeah, so um, at this point, it, it, because there isn't any guidance, um, then um, there's essentially neither one is really um, acceptable, right? Or neither one is really um, is really considered to be overwhelmingly better than the other. Technically, it can't be considered a supplement yet, but it is also not really considered a food um, food additive. So there's, we've even seen some brands invent their own ways of um, presenting it so that they don't have to say drug facts, they don't have to say supplement facts, they don't have to say nutrition facts, and they'll just say things like, product facts or things of that nature. So there's not really kind of one magic right answer there again, because there is no guidance from, you know, from the FDA yet. So there's not really a strong, um, you know, a strong um, standard to uphold, which is one of the challenges right now. So um, unfortunately we don't have a great answer for you yet. <laughs> <laughs> okay, a couple more questions here. Mm -hmm. uh, one is around purchase intent and uh, mm -hmm. what's the difference between the percentage of CBD users uh, who purchase for pain relief and inflammation or pain relief and inflammation versus general wellness and calming? Because uh, data mm -hmm. uh, he's citing different reports may have different numbers. Yeah, absolutely. So, you know, from, um, from, our, I don't have all of the exact numbers off the top of my fingers right now, but happy to, um, to share those, um, you know, with you after the presentation. Um, we do find that, you know, as we look at those kind of top five, um, you know, positionings um, in uh, pain relief and physical relief um, has dropped to be number four, um, you know, behind um, anxiety, depression, and, um, um, and um, kind of emotional relief overall. Um, now, um, that is still a strong percentages, approximately 26% um, or so is, um, you know, are purchasing for, um, for pain relief um, or inflammation. And it really depends on the product type um, for, um, obviously, if you're purchasing a topical product, um, then you're going to um, be using more heavily for, um, for pain relief or inflammation um, than you would if you're um, purchasing a CBD drink, for example, that may more be focused for relaxation or, um, you know, or things like that. Great. Um, so, you mentioned the FDA regs and, you know, it's possible that they're going to change, but it's possible it may take longer. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Did they prep as if, or, you know, it's going to mm -hmm. change or, you know, mm -hmm. how do you kind of balance both? You got to get ready just mm -hmm. in case, but on mm -hmm. the other hand, it may still be a while or COVID may prevent it. You know, who knows? Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. So it's a great question. And, you know, essentially um, brands right now um, should continue to develop their products and continue to um, try to market their products as aggressively as possible, mm -hmm. right? Um, you know, focus on your product formulations, even if it takes, a, you know, the, the things that brands should be doing today um, will continue to benefit them up until, you know, the FDA gives guidance um, and they should try to aggressively expand their, um, you know, their distribution as, as much as they can to date, right? Um, as much as they can in the existing port, um, the existing environment, uh, whether that is nine months from now, whether that is 12 months from now, whether that is 24 months from now, um, they should continue to grab as much share as they possibly can and get as far and wide as they possibly can right now. Um, because regardless of when that happens, um, they're not going to get this time back and they have as little competition right now as they ever will, right? Uh, you know, from a retailer standpoint, um, you know, it is, it's really up to kind of at the corporate level of each um, retailer, whether 
where they want to start putting a toe in the water um, and start carrying CBD products. Um, again, many retailers are um, starting to carry ingestible products um, right now because we've really seen that there isn't a very high risk level for most of them. Um, those that have started to carry um, carry products are not getting, um, you know, are not um, having significant crackdowns on them. They're not getting products pulled from shelves. They're not, um, you know, getting risk slapped from a regulatory standpoint overall, right? So that's kind of emboldened retailers, um, you know, as well as, you know, some of the larger CPG brands that are starting to put toes in the water. Um, you know, if, as people put toes in the water, if they don't get slapped back, um, you know, then we see that, you know, continue and continue moving forward. So, um, you know, that's, that has to go through all the legal eagles that everybody is <laughs> at everybody's headquarters. And it's a, you know, it's a company level strategic decision, um, you know, but, uh, you know, it's more and more companies are, are becoming a bit more emboldened to that. Yeah. They're just going to take a chance and grab what they can <laughs> until they get slapped. And if it's not a bad slap, well, they'll just go back to it. <laughs> and in the meantime, don't make health claims. Don't make health claims. Don't make health claims. Don't make health claims. Right. That is the the biggest thing that has kind of um, sparked the ire of the, um, you know, the FDA is if um, if brands are making health claims or if people are, are making health claims overall. So, you know, um, you know, trying to be a good actor, um, you know, and um, and play by the rules there. But, you know, certainly, certainly don't make health claims. <laughs> that is the, the biggest way to uh, to uh, to get the FDA on your back. <laughs> Excellent. And, and to that point, just to let everybody know, um, we also we share or we will be sharing with everybody an interview I did with Hope and Law Group, where we dug into mm -hmm. what can be said and what cannot be said from mm -hmm. a legal perspective. So everybody mm -hmm. should be receiving that. And, you know, uh, um, Bridget uh, from last year, you guys met. So, uh, yeah. So so what's the best way for everybody to reach you? Um, so my email is provided at, um, you know, at, on the end of the slides, um, okay. people can feel free to reach out to me, um, you know, after the presentation and, um, you know, happy to happy to connect and answer any more questions or if there's any specific data points, I'm happy to share those after as well. Mm -hmm. Great. And we've recorded this uh, webcast, so we'll be sharing with everybody uh, mm -hmm. afterwards. So again, everybody in the audience, thank you for joining us. And Bethany, thank you so much mm -hmm. for the great presentation. Fantastic. Thank you. Take care, everybody. Bye -bye.